you know, I was asked to deliver a keynote speech, and I usually say no to these things because they're hard to do, and I'm, because uh, I'm often sitting where you are uh, listening. And, and I think the main thing is, uh, for something like this morning, I'm going to try to entertain you a little bit, but mostly educate you a little bit. And in the end, at the end of my talk, I'm going to have two key takeaways, I think, that uh, you know, you want to leave the room knowing more than you came in, and you want to have some sort of an action item or something. Okay, so what? Um, after this 45-minute talk, how am I better in some way for this? Well, we'll see if that happens. Uh, here we go. Oh, oh, and first of all, welcome for uh, scaling, or congratulations on scaling Mount Caesars there. Uh, I don't know much about escalator design, but it seems like there might have been a better way. Um, it was kind of intimidating. Here we go. So agenda and goals. Uh, I, I think I explained the goals. It's just for you to know, know more than when you came in, be mildly entertained, but also you know, have something that applies directly to you. In other words, I'm going to, my, my last two bullet points are going to be something uh, for you to bring to your company and to you and your career path. Um, the the Q&A, uh, because it's such a large room, Q&A isn't totally feasible, but I'll uh, be happy to stick around after the presentation ends uh, pretty promptly at 8.45 uh, to answer questions, and I'll be lurking around all day today, too. So what, one of the things that we're going to start with is just sort of this vocabulary issue, uh, and there, there's no set definition for any of these terms, and that's a key takeaway. The field is so new that different terms have different meanings. So if you're a, a customer-facing person or if you're internal-facing, you have to clearly define uh, your terms. But that said, here is how I define, not that I'm the great expert, but here is how I define, and most of my colleagues define these five key terms. Uh, data science is just sort of a very broad term, and it applies, it, it has a, Hint of traditional statistics, and we'll have more to say about that. Uh, by the way, especially on this slide, uh, if anyone wants to counter-argue this, wave your hand wildly and say, you're, you're wrong, meaning to me. Now, machine learning is just uh, making predictions from data, and the key word here is predictions. It's so easy to get lost in all this massive amounts of, oh, I was about to say hype, Okay, there is a lot of hype involved, but you know, I'm gonna say right off the bat, this stuff is absolutely real. It's happening right now, it's happening with incredible speed. And I'll, I have some demos too, to, if we get time to go. Uh, but the key word is making predictions, because there's a lot of things that you can do that, that are just sort of like, okay, you, at the end of the exercise you go, well, so what? Okay, but if you can make predictions, and it sounds kind of crass, but if you can make predictions, you can leverage that to do good things. And that typically means making money, and not that money is the source of goodness, but if you have money, you can do good things. Uh, neural network. Uh, neural networks have just exploded onto the scene. They've been around for decades, but in my demo, I'm gonna show you there are three things that happened right around middle of 2015 that have completely revolutionized everything that's going on. Here's a, here's a good way to, to get at that. Does, th think back if you can remember, and I bet you can because I can. The very first time you heard Apple Siri, the very first time, which wasn't that long ago. I mean, and don't, don't, don't just, you know, continuing, okay, I'll just wait for what he says next. You know, engage brain here for a second. See if you can actually come up with that concept. And if you're like me, you are totally amazed. You just go, this is like magic. How, how does this thing work? Now, raise your hand if you're old enough to remember, um, what was it? It was uh, Windows 95 had, or Windows 95 and Dragon Speaking, I think it was called. Dragon? Wow, I'm, uh, good for you all. Now, remember that Dragon thing in the late 90s? It was really, really good, but not quite good enough. You know, it was just this far away from being practical and useful. But then all of a sudden, Siri and Alexa and Cortana just exploded onto the scene. And it was like magic, uh, literally magic. 
And what happened there was this was all a direct result of deep learning neural networks. And I'll explain exactly what that means. So a deep neural network is, uh, I've got a slide up here, but I'll just summarize it and say it's just a complicated neural network, okay? Um, and artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is a term that's come and gone in and out of favor for decades and decades because it has consistently overpromised and underdelivered. Uh, but it's back in the news now. Um, but it's really quite simple. Um, artificial intelligence, I'll tell you this, you're probably at some point, uh, you're going to see some sort of a PowerPoint slide that's got like a Venn diagram with circles galore that are trying to describe the relationships between machine learning and data science and artificial intelligence. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping, <laughs> I've given really bad talks before, <laughs> you know, the hook comes out, you go, okay, you're done. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, you know, Venn diagrams of, uh, I think I hit my little red button by accident, uh, Venn diagrams uh, the relationship between all these things. Well, that's just an exercise in futility. Artificial intelligence is two things. Number one, it's specialized predictions, okay, it's a form of machine learning, but it somehow mimics or caricatures human. And there's five senses, right? We have five senses, <laughs> although <laughs> I was going to make a joke about managers sometimes seem to have one or two fewer. But most of us have five senses, I guess, and um, it's uh, vision, hearing, and so forth. And I'll, I'll claim that machine learning and artificial has essentially solved those sensory problems. In other words, speaking and understanding what the words are and so forth. But there's a, a last thing that's part of artificial intelligence, and that's the reasoning component, un true understanding. And that's the part right now where I say we're nowhere close to, to getting any of this understood. So that's just some vocabulary. Um, I, I threw this slide in. Uh, as Lauren mentioned in the introduction, I run what's called the Microsoft AI School. Um, just over two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, my little organization was formed directly by the top most people. I avoid mentioning their names because I, I get scared to mention them, but you, you'd know their names because Microsoft decided we're all in on two things. We're all in on cloud computing and we're all in on machine learning, not necessarily artificial intelligence. And so we, we give training to people in our company. That's what I do. This is what our experts know. If somebody has a machine, a senior level machine learning role in most of the uh, organizations I work with, they know this stuff, okay? The point here is that you can't, or maybe don't want to know all that stuff, but you should know those specific terms, what they mean. You don't have to be able to implement them or understand them at a deep level, but you do need to know exactly what these are so you can communicate with subject matter experts, which is probably gonna be, for most of you in this room, a key role. It's not my goal to provide you with a career path on how to become a hardcore machine learning engineer, although I will point the way to that. I think for most of you who are likely in early to mid careers, it looks like, you want to be able to use this stuff to leverage, help your company and help yourself. And most of that is understanding what these terms are. Um, machine learning, this is a, I had a little demo that I'll, I'll run if I have time. This is an example of, and after this point my, my uh, talk starts to break down. You know, I don't have lecture, I just have all kinds of miscellaneous slides. Um, this is my little Zoltar NFL football uh, prediction uh, system. It's an example of machine learning because and, oh, by the way, unfortunately for you all in this room, before I started working at Microsoft, I was a university professor for decades. Um, and so I tend to ask you questions. So what's the key word for machine learning? No, someone said learning. Wrong. Starts with a P. Ends with redictions. Predictions, okay. It's a little bit early, I get it, but let's, let's focus here. And... For if you can predict uh, NFL football scores, is that a hard problem, predicting who's going to win? Right, let me think, think carefully. This is a trick question. Since we're here in Vegas, um, 
uh, and betting, it's always kind of dicey to talk about this because there's a, a negative ethical issues surrounding it, and I, I don't address those. I just address the mathematics of it all. Um, but is it hard to predict who's going to win an NFL football game or a, a, a European soccer league? No, it's not that hard. But that's not going to do you any good. You have to out-predict everybody else. You have to identify situations where um, people are betting um, through their hearts and so forth. So, but anyway, uh, I can run that demo uh, sometime, and I have my little Zoltar here. Now, data science, we were talking about these terms earlier. Look up here at the slide, and I'll bet you a lot of you recognize this. Um, uh, what is this? I mean, uh, I, let me rephrase it and say, uh, data science is associated with one particular technology slash language slash whatever. What's this? R. This is still true. Um, in other words, so sometimes you all know this, but sometimes it's good to hear uh, something that you think is true reiterated by uh, someone else. R is still the language of data science. It's uh, increasing in importance and popularity. It's been around for decades. Um, does anyone know? Just I always like, I, I, I love the R language. I've used it for I, back into the 80s. Um, but does anyone know what the predecessor language to R was? Yeah, a lot of people said S. Yeah, so you go, it's backwards, but anyway. Uh, the data science is still uh, often dominated by R, but here's where I, I bring this up for this difference. The graph on the right-hand side here, to me, the difference between data science and machine learning, one of the differences is that in data science, the human is really tied into the loop, and that at the end of the process, there's often a human interpretation and that comes from data visualizations and things like that. Humans are still incredibly good at looking at graphs and charts and inferring meaning from them, okay? Um, here, okay, now, if you know absolutely nothing at 845, I hope you're gonna know these next two slides. If you understand, if you understand these next two slides, you'll have gained, you will, have all you need to know about neural networks and understanding where you need to go next in your learning uh, journey. So what is a neural network? The, the first question I always have is, there's all these different machine learning techniques. I had that, there, there are dozens and dozens and dozens. The first problem is identifying when is a neural network applicable? And for me, it's pretty simple. If I can drop my data into an Excel-like spreadsheet, and the goal is to predict the values in any one of the columns from the other columns, then you are smi right smack dab in the wheelhouse of a neural network, okay? So look at this uh, hypothetical, it's actually not hypothetical, it's a subset of actual data. Each person is obviously a, uh, or each row is a, a person, and we've got the person's age, their annual income, some sort of education level, you know, is this a higher education or, you know, some sort of corporate training education, who knows, and their gender, and the goal is to predict political party affiliation, where the three choices are Democrat, Republican, and other. So neural networks are not magic. You have to have, sometimes it's called training data or labeled data, and all that is is data with known correct answers. And I know I'm gonna to forget to say this later, so I'll say it now. We, we have absolutely conquered this scenario is a slam dunk as of early 2016. I don't care how big this is, how complicated it is, we can so solve this problem, okay, if it's solvable. Um, but the huge bottleneck right now, the gigantic bottleneck in machine learning occurs right here at this point. Does anyone take a stab what I'm talking about? What's the bottleneck? A little bit louder over there? Yeah, finding the right answers, and I'll reiterate that and say that, getting labeled data. Where does this come from? Well, normally it comes from a human being that sits down and labels us. And we don't need tens or hundreds or thousands. We normally need hundreds of thousands of labeled examples. Now, again, I know I'm gonna forget this, so I'm gonna tell you now. The area, okay, machine learning of, this is called supervised learning with labeled data, this is 
where all the action is right now. This is the present of machine learning, the absolute present. But many people, my colleagues, feel that there's a, 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 a different form of machine learning called, and I'll give you the, uh, the letters, the acronym. Does anyone know what RL stands for? RL. Reinforcement learning is correct. Reinforcement learning is similar to this, but instead of having labeled data that appeared by some human being, the machine learns as it goes on. And we'll see, I have a slide coming up, and no matter what happens, I'm gonna hit you this slide, because it is the single most, uh, two incidents in my, okay, I'm gonna ask you to think it again. Think of an incident in your life that just absolutely changed the direction of your life. Maybe you were young in grade school, a grade school teacher. Maybe it was a high, uh, it's often a teacher, or something like that. <laughs> Hopefully, in my case, one of those had to do with law enforcement, but that's a different story. That was a joke. Okay, I'm just sort of sensing the mood here. We'll, uh, we'll rein in on the, uh, the early morning jokes and go back to, uh, dang it, did I do that again? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, one of the, the two most remarkable moments in my life was the first one in 1968 when I was a student at the University of California, Irvine. I saw one of the very first chess playing computers. My jaw dropped, and I was just like, I, I, my heart stopped beating, it was, it was that. And I'm gonna tell you the success of that happened exactly one year ago, and I'll show you that slide. And you'll, you will be amazed too, maybe. <laughs> well, you'll be amazed one way or the other. Either you'll be amazed at the actual content or be amazed that I was amazed, so something like that. Anyway, back to the neural networks thing. Uh, re, uh, training data, uh, is with known answers. Reinforcement learning, we'll talk about later. It could be it does not have that bottleneck, and this is where uh, a lot of things are headed. Now, our goal down at the bottom of the thing is to predict, predict, keyword predict, um, the political party affiliation of a 35-year-old person whose income is $49,000, who has an education of high level, uh, who is a male, and what is their political party affiliation. Down at the very bottom of the slide, is, is an important thing too. With regards to, I think, uh, I mentioned this before, what you really need to know for your career path is how to communicate with all levels. You need to be able to communicate with executives who deal with very high level aspects of machine learning, and you also need to be able to deal at a very low tactical level. It's like you bring your car in to service, right? You need to be able to communicate. It's, have you ever done this, and we all have, you bring your car in and the service writer asks you, what's wrong with your car? And you go, well, it's making kind of like click, click, artwork, and you're trying to simulate what it sounds like. Whereas if you knew more about it, you'd be able to communicate with, I think it's coming from this area, that area. But down at the bottom, the point here is that there's absolute vocabulary chaos in machine learning. For instance, the, the variables to, um, you, that are the predictor variables are sometimes called the independent variables. What kind of people, what, wh where does that term come from traditionally? Independent variables. Who said that? You're correct. Correct, statistics. Um, predictors, signals comes from electrical engineers. Attributes comes from different fields. Um, my point here is that machine learning, everybody who's coming into it comes from a different vertical, um, uh, engineering or medical or whatever, and they all brought their own vocabulary with them, and it creates a very, very difficult uh, communication. And is anybody in sort of a salesy type role? No? Oh, that's odd. But in a, yeah, <laughs> one guy over there and he's all afraid, to <laughs> are you gonna kick me out? <laughs> No, but in sales it's often you, you never want to show that you don't know something because that's a sign of weakness and you, you, know, you can be taken advantage of. My point here is when you communicate with machine learning, you must constantly be asking questions and constantly asking for clarification of terms. And this is a sign of strength, it is not a sign of weakness. It shows that you totally get that the same term has 20 different uh, descriptors. Same thing with the thing to predict. Okay, so we set up what the problem is. Here's how the neural network works. On the left-hand side is the values we're, what we're trying to predict. There, there's a lot to say here, but basically a neural network is nothing more than numbers in, numbers out. It, it almost becomes too simple. And, and 
deflating. You, you know, you want to go, that's, that's all there is? It's just, it's just a really super complex math function. Yes, but we'll see that, that, that's true, that's true, but we're going to see that there's more to it than this. So on the very left is our predictor variables. Now, what is going on in that second column? Well, up at the top, there's actually two things going on. We, 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 uh, we prank our uh, employees and just say what's happening. And the answer is, well, there isn't one thing that happens. There's two things that are happening. So look at the, two, the age and the income. What's going on there in non-technical terms? Oh, who said that? Uh, I'll, I'll rephrase and say yes, but what they're doing is they're, we're scaling the numbers. The numbers have to be scaled or normalized so that large numbers like income don't overwhelm the smaller numbers. Now, it, you're all reacting, oh, yeah, it just seems like it makes sense somehow. But uh, if you dive into the details, you understand why that's absolutely necessary for this stuff to work good. Now, I can tell you that because I taught this stuff. Oh, I know, I, here, here's something. Suppose you want to learn about this stuff. Um, most people in this room, I'm betting, have some form of inferiority complex. Like, oh, this is for engineers. I don't write code, this, that, and that. And we're constantly getting requests from people who are like UI designers. Um, business managers, um, every kind of role you can imagine that, that has nothing to do with they've never written a line of code, they've never actually even looked at a line of code. And they ask, do you have any courses for us? And the answer is, yes, we do. It's the same courses we give to everybody. I'm going to show you some code. And coding is not magic. Every engineer, I, I'll boast, which I often do, I'm as good as there is in this field. And I learn just like everybody else. I don't just magically pull stuff out of the ether. I take an existing program and slowly modify it and make it work. So my point here is that suppose I could say, OK, I could give you a one hour course on how to normalize data. One hour, not even one hour, 40 minutes. I don't care what your background is, you would know everything there is to know about how to normalize data, and you would be an expert in that area. So this isn't rocket science. You can learn it to whatever level you want. And in fact, I was talking to Lauren. I give a one full day workshop, both internally at Microsoft and externally, the exact same content, and we go through this neural network concepts. I claim in one eight-hour session, you can learn everything you need to know to be a technical expert and actually create these things on your own or communicate with any subject matter expert. And the, the hope is that we can do this next year at this time. Yes, Lauren's staring at me like, what is he talking about? Was, <laughs> I have no recollection of this uh, conversation whatsoever. OK, now, so the data has to be normalized. Now, for education and gender, neural networks are just math functions. They only understand numbers. So non-numeric data has to be converted into numbers. And that's called encoding. I could give you an hour and a half lecture on encoding. It's slightly more complicated. But you would know everything you need to know. Look at the very bottom one. Male is encoded as minus 1. Now we know that, that gender is male-female. If I didn't tell you, you would probably go, OK, uh, the question is, OK, we've got male and female. Convert them into one of two numbers. You'd probably use what and what? Zero and one. And in fact, that would sort of work. But it turns out that minus one and plus one for binary predictor variables works better. You go, OK, well, so what? Well, not so what, that's it. <laughs> that's what you need to know at one level. And now you know everything you need to know about encoding binary predictor variables, minus one and plus one. Although you don't know exactly why, you know, that, that is so. OK, so once we pre-process the data, and you have certainly heard this over and over and over again, and I'll reiterate it. At minimum of 90% of your time, effort, and pain occurs preparing the data for the neural network is it doesn't look like much, but it's hugely annoying, hugely time consuming, and just irritating as all heck, okay? When I say irritating as all heck, for people like me, math guys, who just want to get into the neural network stuff. And 
Uh, that's just the way it is. Now, once you've uh, pre-processed, you go into that green box, which is the neural network. The input values are there. The hidden processing nodes, there are four hidden nodes there. That's where most of the computations are done. And then there's the output. Let's move on, though, and assume that there are three output values there, 0 0.23, 0 0.62, and 0.15. Those are the actual numbers I got from that actual data. My claim is, remember the problem was, predict Democrat, Republican, or other. Can anybody infer why those three numbers mean Republican? What, look at those three numbers. There's a, a relationship between them. So I heard several people say that they sum to one. They add up to one. The way neural networks are designed is that your output values will sum to one so that they can be interpreted as probabilities. Therefore, those three numbers are the probability of Democrat, the probability of Republican, the probability of other. Now, there's a whole, I hope, we don't have any deep mathematicians here because you'd be enraged right now. These aren't really probabilities, but they can be interpreted as such, okay? So that means Republican. Okay, now going back, the magic of the neural network occurs in the green box. Each one of those lines represents a mathematical constant, and the con is just a number, like 0.2378. And the red arrows, the little red arrows, are also constants, special constants called biases. And they're just numbers. The whole idea is you use the training data to determine the values of each one of those lines, and that defines the model. That's it. In seven minutes, that is everything you need to know about neural networks. Now, what's a deep neural network? Well, the neural networks of the type I just described here um, have been well known for a long time, and they're relatively easy to do, but they can only work for relatively simple problems. Okay, just based on this in pi picture, infer what is a deep neural network? What's the only, well, what's the key architectural difference? Who said that over there? Correct, more hidden layers. A deep neural network is one with more hidden layers, or equivalently, one that's really complicated. Now you go, well, so what? You just add hidden layers. When you add hidden layers, what are we adding exponentially more of? We're not just adding the nodes. The nodes just go up uh, arithmetically. You know, you double them or triple them. But exponentially increasing, you're going from um, possibly hundreds to possibly, and I'll show you an example on my laptop, of billions of the weights, these lines. As you increase the number of hidden nodes, the number of these weights to determine becomes increasingly, uh, incredibly difficult. And that's the, the processing bottleneck. But everything else is the same. Okay, now, this is, uh, I think, I'm sort of hopping around now. This is a uh, sort of one of, the, I'd say not one of the, this is the hottest area right now today of deep neural networks. Uh, th this is mind-blowing, too. And I, I have a demo that I'll, I'll try to, to show you this. LSTM stands for Long Short-Term Memory Recurrent Neural Network, one of the worst names ever devised. But what this is is, do you see the, um, uh, the there's across the middle of the diagram is four little yellow boxes, and they have a sigma, a sigma, a tau, and a sigma just to show off fancy Greek letters. Each one of those is basically a deep neural network. And then the rest of the architecture is additional plumbing. So what's going on here is that the field has changed starting in 2016. Instead of dealing with simple neural networks, we're taking these things and composing them into increasingly complex modules. And these things are the magic. Uh, I hope we have time to show you the demo. It's, it, it's just mind-numbing how, how it, you just go, how did that work? Uh, that's incredible. But the analogy is this. I, d I don't know much about electrical engineering, but I know in the early days they, they created transistors and capacitors and stuff like that. And then uh, all of electronics was putting these together in increasingly complex systems. Well, that's exactly what's going on right now with machine learning. These systems are increasingly 
complicated by composing these different modules. And an LSTM, now an LSTM network is designed, it has completely revolutionized natural language processing. Okay, we'll do a little, this is Vegas. So, we'll pick the guy right here in the front to abuse. Okay, here's $20. Lauren, can you come up and be the assistant, please? I'm gonna risk $20, which believe me, based on last night is a drop in the bucket too. <laughs> Hold this $20 bill, verify it's real. Now, you're gonna win $20. I have a sentence in my mind, and trust me, I'm not gonna lie, although I might if my $20 is at risk. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I have a sense in mind, it's a real sentence, and I will, um, I'm going to tell you uh, part of the sentence, and I will give you the 20, or Lauren will give you the $20, if you can predict the next word. And I want you all to think, too, see, and see, see if you would have won the $20. Okay, so it's a sentence. The first word of the sentence is the. Crowd goes silent. Okay, what's the next word? Yeah. The cat. Actually, not a bad uh, guess, but incorrect. <laughs> um, now, I'll give you the first two words of the sentence. The quick. The quick brown fox. Da, da, da. Okay. The point here is with natural language processing, it's not a one shot deal. To predict, remember the key word is predict, to predict the next word in a sentence, you need the context of all the previous words. And that's what an LSTM recurrent neural network does. The, the first neural networks that I've described have no memory. Every new input is completely isolated. But an LSTM network has memory of the previous words, which makes them insanely powerful. In some ways, you can think of an LSTM as a tiny little computer because it has a memory, it has input, it has output. It can do incredible stuff. And I'll show you a demo. Lauren, what time is it? About 8.35. Nah, I don't have time for it. But trust me, I would, I would pull it up, I have it running on my laptop, and uh, I'll describe what it is. There's a famous, the most famous, well, there's a bunch of famous examples. It's called the IMDB Sentiment Analysis Problem. You've all probably seen or heard of the IMDB uh, movie database website. The, the problem is there are 50,000 labeled movie reviews. These are actual reviews from users. Thank you. And um, the, LS, so the problem is you have to, the, the review is like, this movie was incredible, or something like that, and it's a positive review or a negative review. So the goal is to predict, is this a good review or a bad review? And it's, it's almost like magic, and an LSTM can do this. And I was, if I would have had time, I would have run the demo right in front of you, and you would have been amazed. Okay, so 10 more minutes, let's see. Uh, LSTMs, this is sort of, they're, they're, there's two kinds of takeaways you should have from today. Sort of these global, generic, this stuff is real and it's new. The specific takeaway is LSTMs have completely revolutionized natural language processing. I work with some, uh, at Microsoft Research with some people who've been working with natural language processing their entire lives. And does anyone know like what a stop word is? Yeah, imagine you're trying to figure all this stuff out. It's incredibly hard. You have to do, what, what, what do I do with the word and? Is it important or not? I mean, all this stuff. Um, LSTMs and neural techniques obliterated traditional lateral language overnight. It just rendered them completely obsolete, which isn't entirely true. There are still certain, many certain problems where the traditional techniques work much better. Okay, a convolutional neural network. Um, this is, ironically, one of the most common types of problems that you'll see in training courses and stuff like that, but it's, it's actually sort of the least used. And a convolutional neural network is one that has special architecture designed for image understanding and image classification. Here's, um, this is a famous picture only because, well, we can talk about, I was gonna talk about the girl in the hat. It was sort of a cultural thing, but we'll skip her, bye. Okay, here's the same problem. If you're trying to, okay, on the very left-hand side is an image, 28 by 28. It's a famous, uh, it's called MNIST. There's an MNIST data set of digits that were pulled from, I think it was from 
government documents where people had to fill in things by, by hand. And that's obviously a seven. But a human being, to identify this, is an incredibly challenging problem for a computer to, to identify that as a seven. And it turns out that there's strong evidence that we don't look at the whole image there and identify it in one giant blob. We identify it by scanning different features of the image. For instance, a seven, there's a bar across the top, there's a diagonal bar, and they're two connected in a certain geometry. A convolutional neural network, CNN, um, does that kind of stuff, and if you look at it. Now, look all the way at the end. Um, the output of this thing. The, the output, the final outputs are 0, or 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0, 0, 0.0, 0, 0, 0.0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.1, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0. Do you see those there? What's the relationship of those numbers? They have a relationship with each other. They sum to one. My point here is that once you understand the basic neural networks that we had in those two slides, you understand all the complicated versions. All the complicated versions ha have the same fundamental uh, ideas. So which one is the highest? 0.8, which is the probability associated with that's a seven. So it works the same. It's not magic. You can learn all this stuff. Okay, I'm going to use my last five minutes or so. The, this is the present of machine stuff just works. It's awesome. But here is a, a, a peek at some of the things that are uh, coming down the road very quickly. Um, right now, this is uh, more of the, the present. There are one, two, three, four neural network li code libraries that dominate the engineering world. TensorFlow from Google, CNTK from Microsoft, Keras, which is a, uh, a cousin to Google TensorFlow, and PyTorch, which came out of Facebook. Um, right now, our engineers at Microsoft are very stressed because it's not feasible to learn all four because they're very difficult to learn. So you have to roll your career dice and figure out which ones to focus on. It's not clear which one, if any, of these will emerge as the dominant library. Things are still very much up in the air. Um, this is an uh, example. There's the, uh, the MNIST example to show you that this stuff isn't magic. It just works. I don't know what that one is, an example. Here's yet another again of the image classification to illustrate the point that you just get outputs that are uh, interpreted as probabilities. Uh, an area that um, is sort of on the cusp of what's new is uh, neural-based time series. Time series problems are incredibly difficult. They've been around forever. But a lot of sales data and stuff like this follows, you know, where, where along the x-axis you've got some indication of time. LSTMs are being successfully applied to these problems because an LSTM has memory. So instead of looking at just one time point, you've got this history. But it's a really hard problem. There's an actual, I have a demo that I don't have time to show you that you can get very, uh, almost magical predictions of these time series problems. Um, neural an anomaly detection, um, that, that's a whole topic in itself. It's one of the hottest areas. Anomaly detection just means identifying the bad stuff. And that's a huge problem. And neural techniques are just now taking over. When I say just now, I'm going to claim in the last probably 16 months or so. This is all very new stuff. Uh, not entirely well understood. This is uh, natural language processing, part of the LSTM thing. Um, applications, I'll skip that one. Okay, now here's some of the really looking forward. So, some of the, it's not all great news. Um, one is, uh, oh, self-driving vehicles. You know, you may have seen them driving around here in Las Vegas, one of the uh, early prototype towns. I would never get in one of those cars because I know how this stuff is implemented. It all boils down to the training bottleneck. You know, you can't train. The classic example is, okay, what happens if one of these self-driving cars is running down the road and sees a cow lying in the middle of the road? Well, it's never seen a cow lying in the middle of the road before. What's it going to do? Well, I don't want to be in the car to find out. Um, also, there's a, this is a famous example where you can take an image, it's more along the lines of uh, um, security, where you can take a school bus and make a tiny change that's not visible to a human being with just a few carefully chosen pixels and, force the, uh, and make the uh, classification system think it's an ostrich. 
So it's just like, you know, this means, is this, well, anyway, there's a lot of interesting things here. I don't want to be in an ostrich. Um, this is a, a GAN, generative adversarial networks, interesting topic in the future. Um, there's many companies with imaging. There are uh, over, there's well over 20 companies that are throwing these small briefcase sized uh, satellites up in the sky. Instead of one giant billion dollar satellite, they're throwing up hundreds of these thousand, multi-thousand dollar things. And the problem here is they're being swamped with imagery data. Uh, what do they do with it? Well, the only way it can be addressed is through uh, uh, in a machine. Oh, here it is. Okay, I'm going to stop right. This is going to be my last, my last slide. I promise, Lauren, because I can tell she's getting nervous. This is this. It, it just absolutely blew my mind. Alpha Zero. Has anyone heard of Alpha Zero? If you, wow. Okay. I, it is mind. -blowing. The history of computer science is well, or closely associated with the history of computer chess, going back to the 1940s when it was theoretical. 1950s, the early things. And then I told you in 1968, I saw one of the earliest computers that plays chess. This problem has been addressed by the world's greatest minds for over 50 years. And it has culminated in insanely powerful chess programs that can defeat any human being. You might remember from the late year, uh, 90s, you heard of something called IBM's Deep Blue Machine, beat the world champion Garry Kasparov. But anyway, so uh, Google created this Alpha Zero. It uses deep reinforcement learning, that type of learning that doesn't require labeled data, the traditional one, and they matched it against the world championship program called Stockfish, which that's a very odd name. The names of these chess programs are kind of like racehorses, where they take names from the predecessors and munch them together. So Stockfish had something to do with some other program named Stock something. You get the idea. Okay, Stockfish is the world champion. It obliterates any human being. No, no human being has a possible chance against it, and it, it destroys all its computer competition, too. Using deep reinforcement learning, Google trained Alpha Zero. All it did was give it the rules of the game. Trained it for eight hours. Okay, now, this was closely followed by me and everybody else, and we're all scoffing. My friend, <laughs> This is going to be a massacre. The culmination of the greatest minds in human history applied to a problem for over 50 years versus eight hours of training. Okay? And sure enough, the results came back, and it was a massacre, 28 to 0. And we're all reading that. Yep, we knew it. And then, wait a minute. Alpha 0, 1, 28 to 0. Alpha 0, alpha zero obliterated obliterated stockfish after eight hours of training. It, I mean, it, it was the second most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life, and my heart stopped again for the second time. And it, it just mind-numbing about what this implies about the future of machine learning and artificial intelligence. It, it, just unimaginable consequences. Okay, I'm gonna get, stop here by giving the two key takeaways, okay? When you go out of this room, this stuff is absolutely real. It's happening right now. It's happening incredibly fast. You don't have to be on the leading edge of understanding all this stuff, and your company doesn't have to be on the leading edge of understanding this stuff. But I do claim that if you were my close, my friends, my neighbors, my children, whatever, I'd say your company is at risk and your career, oh, let's not put it this way. There's insane opportunities for your company and for your career path to not necessarily be first in this field, but you don't want to be any later than third into the field, if you know what I mean. You don't have to be the early adopter, but you, it just knowing about this stuff, you have an unlimited opportunities, and this is where everything else is going and everything else. That's all. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the show and uh, the rest of your talk.